Here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to TCAP training. My name is Azra Syed. I'm a TCAP training coordinator. Today's training is on civil engineering and aviation fueling design, construction, and inspection process. Since I am recording this presentation, I would like your um, cooperation if we could uh, stay muted during the training and keep your uh, cameras off. Uh, if you have questions, please type them in the chat box and we will answer all the questions at the end of the training. Now I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan to introduce the presenters and go over the agenda. Ryan, all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azra. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. It's been a while since we had our our webinars. We had a small break in between, but we just really want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And before we kick off, again, um, we can't ask you guys enough for your feedback. We do appreciate every feedback you guys share with us. We do share this with our presenters as well in order to improve our presentations and improve our future presentations. So if there's anything in specific you want us to touch point on, please let us know. We do really want to hear from you. Feel free to scan, scan this QR code and let us know how we're doing and let us know what you want to hear about in the future. We are having a small redesign coming up for our future presentations. Um, so please stay on the loop. Um, this uh, webinar series is almost coming to an end at the end it's August, right? August, August, September. But we both come back with more interesting topics as we continue on. I'll be sure to post this link also in the chat box so you can grab it from there. So today, civil and aviation fueling webinar, the design, construction, and inspection process led by a fantastic team here from the Port Authority. In the design review, we have uh, Noah Romanowski, who is our chief civil engineer, and James Hoon, who is a program engineer within the mechanical engineering division. For construction phase, we have Carmela Sinocolo and Daniel Pineda. They represent the resident engineer's office at the LaGuardia Airport. And for the inspection process, quality assurance division, uh, Jamal Avigalas, who is the supervising structural engineer. All of these folks have fantastic things to say. And without further ado, I'm just going to open the floor for the EADD team to go over their presentation, and we will get back to you at the end. So please make sure, like Azra mentioned, to type your questions in the chat box. And at the end, we will have also a Q&A session to go over those questions. So without further ado, all yours. Okay, thanks, Ryan. As Ryan mentioned, I'm Noah Romanowski. I'm the Chief Civil Engineer with the Port Authority's Engineering Design Department. I'm joined by James Poon, a senior principal engineer with Design's Mechanical Engineering Group. Uh, we've combined for the design portion, we've combined the civil and mechanical. So James and I are going to be going back and forth a little bit. Um, but I'll stick to mostly the civil items and James will be speaking to the aviation uh, fueling, fueling uh, items. A little first, a little bit about uh, civil and mechanical design. Our groups are part of the Port Authority's engineering design division. The bulk of our day is spent delivering capital and operating projects from planning to final design. We hand it over to our construction management division for the actual construction, uh, but we're still involved for any issues or scope changes. Work is done in house where we have the expertise and staff available from a workload point of view. In civil engineering, we traditionally do about 60% of the design work in house. The remainder is completed through external consultants, like uh, probably several of you on the call as through one of our RFPs or call in lists or uh, various other ways that we procure consulting help. We also provide services that don't fall into project specific categories. This can be assistance to the facility staff or planning activities. Uh, one example is uh, of a service engineering is is our is our uh, management of our paving assets at the Port Authority. We have, I think, 4 billion dollars worth of paving assets and we provide the management to track the pavement condition to efficiently and effectively maintain those pavements. We address any engineering or authority initiatives as necessary or requested. Right now, the department is working on a big effort to look how we are structured and uh, changes to streamline the way we deliver projects. 
And lastly, the reason that we're here to review tenant alteration applications. It's a small but important part of our work. In the civil group, it's typically reviewed by a principal engineer assigned to the facility where the work is happening. Uh, a principal engineer usually has about 10 years of experience. And for fueling, it's typically reviewed by an external consultant under the mechanical group. So what triggers a review by our group? Specific to civil engineering, exterior site work will usually trigger a civil review. That work includes airside work like aprons, taxi lanes, unlikely but a taxiway or runway as well, pavements, pavement design, roadways at any of our facilities, parking lots, sidewalks for ADA. Uh, the utilities listed here, storm, water, gas, sanitary. For other major utilities, we started to support the location like duck banks and uh, the aviation filling, fueling lines um, that James will discuss. Lastly, any intermodal rail at a port facility. Uh, it's unlikely that any path work, rail work would be completed under a TA, but that would fall to us should that, should that happen. And I'll turn it to James about aviation fueling on the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. For the aviation fueling systems, uh... Uh, the uh, contract drawings are reviewed to verify that the construction will meet the applic all applicable codes, regulations, and standards. All aviation fueling systems modifications shall not negatively affect airport operations. Uh, all the TAA list uh, below is the list of the items that require for TAA and TAA submissions. This includes the aviation fueling hygiene system, bulk storage tank, aviation fuel pumps emergency fuel shut-off systems, truck loading and offloading facilities, control and inventory system modifications, isolation valve walk modifications, cathodic protection system, and leak detection systems. Aviation fueling system construction documents shall be submitted to QAD with the TAA application for design review. Submit full set of construction drawings with project specifications. Okay, so we, we talked about the areas of work that require review. On the civil side, here are a lot of the major codes and standards that those drawings and specifications are reviewed against. The Port Authority civil design guidelines are listed first. The civil design guidelines are based off these other codes and standards, but it's tailored to our work and fills in some of the blanks or options that are provided by other codes. Generally speaking, the civil design guidelines are required off leasehold or with certain utilities or shared use areas within the leasehold. The other codes and standards are that are listed here, for example, FAA for anything at or near the airport, AASHTO for roadways, intermodal and freight rail is per REMA. However, we, we often defer to the operator, which is usually Conrail. Our civil design guidelines are also based off Conrail. ADA requirements, especially when it comes to sidewalks and pedestrian paths. NFPA for fire protection, as well as drainage around aviation fueling areas. And we're also subject to the same DEC and DEP rules as, as everybody else when it comes to drainage. Many times a permit is required for one of those from the states where the, the project is. Lastly, any requirements from local water, gas, or sewer companies where it exceeds anything we specify. The documentation that's required is signed and sealed drawings, specifications, and calculations as, as necessary. Inside the leasehold, any rec recognized pavement design method is sufficient. Outside the leasehold, we provide a couple methods uh, in, in the civil design guidelines. Drainage, much of that will be done for permitting efforts, but we're, we're looking for that as well. Uh, we want to ensure that there's no impact to tenants or downstream areas. Um, sanitary and water distribution areas are also outlined. In the case of very minimal work, calculations are not required, uh, but that's all outlined in the civil design guidelines. Back to James. OK, 
Okay. Um, uh, depending on the location of the uh, work or the project, uh, if it's in New York, New Jersey, New York City, upstate New York, and whatnot, uh, below are the applicable codes and standards. We have the New York Department of Environmental Conservation Regulations, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection Regulations, New Jersey Uniform Construction Code, New York Construction, New York City Construction Code, New York State Construction Code, NFPA 407 and 30, American Petroleum Institute Standards 650 and 653, American Society of Mechanical Engineers B31.3, Air Transportation Association Standard 103. The uh, required documents for, uh, under the TAA are the uh, science seal contract drawings, project specifications, state licensing certification required documentations, and also calculations uh, such as uh, field demand, catalytic uh, protection, and pipe sizing. Okay, so James and I went through um, some of the uh, areas, what, what triggers a review, um, what we're reviewing it against, and what's required for submission. Um, but we're going to speak now to some common errors and issues that we see. Um, there's a pretty good list here of, of um, items that I've gathered from, from my coworkers and I uh, about typical things that we see, um, like leasehold lines not showed, uh, that's that's important for us so that we understand uh you know what work is what you're affecting off property or off leasehold um so we like to see the leasehold line so that it's clear to us that there's no impact to you know anybody uh an adjacent tenant or or similar um not locating or identifying exi existing utilities uh, we have lots of utilities uh lots of old old things there it's very difficult to get a handle on them um, but we we tell everybody that it's it's worth it to get that information up front you'll you'll probably save yourself in the long run um, but we're not willing to sort of let um, certain uh facility systems be uh you know sort of uh done by the contractor or um you know for the contractor to uh to figure out uh once the the work is opened up um, speaking of the same unresolved conflicts with with other utilities or structures, um, you know, proposed pipes that that seem to conflict with other uh, structures um, um, and structures over utilities, it, you know, it's something that we really really need to pay attention to. Um, we don't like to see any structures over utilities. Sometimes it is not entirely, um, you know, possible to to avoid that. So, um, you know, we're going to want to understand that there's really not an alternative to putting a, a structure over utility. And if so, we're going to want to ensure that the life of the um, whatever utility it is, is going to outlast whatever's building is being built on top of it. And at the same time, should there be a problem or an issue that there's a way for it to be addressed, uh, you know, without knocking the building over or something ridiculous. Um, continuing with the theme of utilities, um, not having enough cover over over proposed utilities. Um, we have separate, and it wasn't mentioned, security guidelines for fence. If you're starting a project and you're going to impact a security fence, um, especially like an airside, uh, a, a fence that separates airside from landside or at a, a ports facility, it's important to get the latest PA security guidelines. It's going to be from the, that facility's uh, security uh, program manager who's going to be able to um, give the requirements for any sort of uh, security fencing um, as a minimum. Um, we like to see the grading, uh, especially where it's required on a, a roadway. Um, uh, and uh, we want to just ensure that water is not being pushed into a tenant's property unnecessarily or beyond what's there. Um, pavement depth for utility trench cuts. Uh, you know, we, if a, a trench is being put in, we're, we're going to want you to replace the same amount of asphalt that's there. Um, and then a lot of times, the, the, if you're putting in sidewalk ramps, um, a lot of, uh, there's a standard detail, but the standard detail doesn't sufficiently describe it for each, um, 
each uh, situation that can can arise. So really, um, we we like to see the individually detailed sidewalk ramps with with the exact or precise grading. This will ensure that you know there's not a problem when it comes to construction to meet the ADA slope requirements and and all the other uh, pieces that come along with that. Um, wildlife attractants in or near aviation areas. Uh, if you saw Miracle on the Hudson, you, you know what that's that's about. And um, conflicting notes due to utilizing PA standards. Um, a lot of times you have your own notes and you um, replicate them and they conflict with a PA standard note that's also added to the drawing. So just double check those to make sure that they don't conflict. And those are some of the common errors and I'll turn it over to James. Thanks. Uh, some of the common errors and issues with aviation fueling um, are update to aviation fueling facility state license, MOSF license, which is a major oil storage facility. Anything greater than 200,000 gallons is considered uh, requires uh, this license. Uh, providing means to permit state require piping tightness tests, providing emergency fuel shutdown system connections, modifications of existing low point drain and high point vents, installation of pipe cooling and catalytic protection systems, in ground pits, aircraft load weighting and installation procedures, coordinate with fuel system operator for draining, fueling piping and schedule system shutdowns, provide fueling and testing procedures, and we deal graphic testing of piping welds. Okay, so some typical keys to success, just um, notifying the tenant coordinators uh, early as possible and addressing the comments and, and responding to the comments. Uh, certainly, if there's a comment review meeting, you know, feel free to in, include us in engineering to um, help resolve anything on the spot. Um, being involved with updating the TCR document um, and then uh, facil facilitating meetings with the EOR during the submission process and uh, facilitating facility maintenance staff review of the project documents and you know, providing a complete design package. I think that's all we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, Noah, and now we pass it over to, there is a question for you, but we'll leave it for, for the end. Um, we'll pass it over to the REO's office, the resident engineer's office. Thank you, Ryan. My name is Carmela Senecolo. I am the resident engineer here at LaGuardia Airport, uh, overseeing the tenant construction process. I also have Dan Panetta from my office, who is an associate engineer. He's an engineer in training. He's my lead inspector. Um, and today's presentation is, again, may look a little familiar. The resident engineer's role is pretty standardized in accordance to what's outlined in the tenant construction manual. For the presentation, we are focusing on this element of work, which is the civil and aviation fueling. I do want to thank Noel and James for providing the level of detail and clarity for design submissions. And um, just to emphasize that once a pre-construction meeting is held, the resident engineer's office is the focal point moving forward, and that's coordination of all uh, stakeholders um, and meetings should there be a need for one. Uh, we are here available, phone call away and email away should there be any questions throughout the project. Uh, we always look forward to assisting each and every um, engineer record and tenant to get to that final permit CFO for occupancy. And um, I'm going to pass this on to Dan so you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you, Carmela. Good afternoon, everybody. 
We're going to start off uh, with the REO's roles and responsibilities, and I'm just going to run through each slide uh, and touch on the um, important or key elements. And when we go into the further slides, we'll, fo we'll put more of an emphasis on the um, civil engineering and aviation fueling aspect of the presentation. So I'm just going to run through these, the critical points. So the resident engineer's office uh, primary role is to remain as the primary Port Authority point of contact all the way from pre-construction to closeout. We coordinate all activities between the tenants team and the various PA groups, PA facility for all construction activities. And we guide the tenant team to a successful project closeout. We do this through all of our responsibilities. First and foremost, we, we audit and monitor the tenant's contractor and design professional for, uh, to ensure that they're complying with all the PA approved documents. We coordinate with the various PA groups to attend and witness any active testing or inspections that are required. The REO confirms that the work being requested for an inspection is complete prior to requesting an inspection. And at the conclusion of any inspection, the REO will issue inspection minutes noting any inspection comments and we'll track the comments to verify that they're resolved prior to scheduling a reinspection. And I would also like to add, um, I'm sure uh, it's known now that we're working via eBuilder. So we're standardizing the process of how these comments are generated with each inspection, how the REO is involved and um, taking uh, uh, an added um, uh, emphasis on the engineer record, maintaining the the updates to those comments once they're uploaded in eBiller, so we can go out in the field and confirm that the work is ready for reinspection. So just bear in mind, um, we're using the eBuilder process for all inspection requests and and TAA uh, requirements, document requirements. Exactly, and as the TCAP process is evolving, the REO is here to keep the tenant team up to date and, and inform them of any changes. That's what we're here for. Next slide, please. I'm gonna briefly touch on design. We wanna emphasize that the tenant and AUR are to conduct a site visit prior to submitting any design documents to identify existing conditions that can um, become an impact during construction. So identifying obstructions in the field, any existing conditions or utilities, identifying time locations or any exposure to the elements may, which may impact the design. The REO reviews contract drawings primarily for constructability and to get an understanding of the scope of work. So we want to understand what the scope of work is and make sure that all the details are provided. So we're looking for the pipe sizes to be called out for, the support types, thickness and types of materials, et cetera. We want to see that the drawings are coordinated between disciplines. If there's work that's going to be uh, happening on the air side, we want to see that the delineation of the air side is outlined in the contract drawings. REO monitors all design comments until they're resolved, and we make sure that any changes to, to the design as a result of the design comments are implemented in the field. And the goal during the design phase is to reach an NFC, no further comment design determination, prior to the pre-con, and this will make sure that we avoid any delays in scheduling inspections or requesting for a certificate of authorization. Next slide, please. So construction or phase two, prior to starting construction, we must conduct a pre-construction meeting. This is the most important meeting of the entire project, which sets, sets us up for success. And at the pre-con meeting, we set the expectations and review any, um, any concerns. So we can schedule a pre-con as soon as all the pre-con documents have been submitted and approved by the REO, and the design reaches at a minimum conditional approval, although full approval is the goal. At the pre-con, as mentioned, we'll go over if there's any open design comments and what the path to an NFC design determination would be. We'll review the pre-con documents, which would include the MWB plan to see that it's been approved, the certificate of insurance. We will review the general contractor's detailed schedule and this is, this is a critical document um, because the contractor should include any critical dates, inspection, ant anticipated inspections, tests, 
go live dates, they should all be included in the contractor's detailed schedule. We want to understand the phasing of the work, if there's any equipment, whether it's called out to be new versus modifications to existing equipment, if there's any excavation, we'll review the procedures, for example, 811 call before you dig, any required MOT, operational requirements, site safety, required special inspections, and the permitting process for hot works, confined space, manhole entry, fire hydrant use. We emphasize at the pre-con meeting that the engineer or architect of record is ultimately responsible for 100% of the work and the inspections. The special inspections must be performed by people who are qualified to perform the inspection, and the AUR must submit copies of signed and sealed special inspection reports under cover letter indicating that they're accepted as the work progresses, so that by the time we're ready to schedule an inspection, the REO already has all of these special inspection reports and they've been reviewed. Uh, the inspection process, process meeting is an optional meeting that is recommended for more complex projects where we can review the required inspections and set the expectations. And moving on to, con to construction. The architect or engineer of record is expected to ensure that all elements of work are complete prior to requesting inspection. Again, I'm going to emphasize that the REO's role is only to monitor and audit all the field work. And this can include attending and witnessing third party special inspections and tests and the contractors to keep the REO updated and provide advance notice of any upcoming pretests and special inspections so that REO can coordinate with the various PA units to attend as necessary. And we'll also um, request that there should be a two week look ahead and that would help us, you know, and uh, coordinate the work and activities that uh, that are set uh, in place in advance. So it's it's highly recommended that a two week look ahead schedule is added to that submission as often as possible. Agreed. Thank you. We can go on to the next slide, please. Where we're going to go over some typical civil and aviation fueling deficiencies. So this is just a list based on REO's past experience of some typical deficiencies that we oftentimes find in the field during an inspection. This list is not fully inclusive, but it's just a couple of examples to keep in mind. So first and foremost, all of the work must be installed as per the latest PA approved contract drawings, the PA 10 construction review manual, and it must be code compliant. For hydrant fuel related construction, we typically see that the welding of the fuel pipe may deviate from the approved drawing or may be found to be deficient or incomplete. The pipe bedding or backfill material is not in conformance with the approved drawings or submittals. The excavation depth may deviate from the design elevation. The stockpile of the pipe may not be choked chocked properly. This could be a safety concern if the stockpile becomes loose and could become a tripping hazard making sure that all the tests are completed prior to scheduling an inspection, which can include flushing te flush tests, hydrostatic tests, and operational tests, ensuring that backflow prevention assemblies are installed where required, uh, dewatering operation not discharged at approved location, submitting all of the required NFPA forms, whether that's for above ground or underground pipe, verifying that the NYC color coding of sprinkler and standpipe systems are followed for the valve handles, and making sure that all the test reports are submitted and the fuel pit also not being at the correct location. That's another typical deficiency. Next slide, please. We're going to go into civil related typical deficiencies that we find in the field. Contractor not properly shoring their excavation or their trench. And also having proper egress and uh, access in and out of the trench or excavation following all OSHA standards. Reinforced concrete steel rebar not in conformance with the approved drawings. During a concrete pour, uh, using a concrete mix design that's not as per the approved submittal. Uh, structural deficiency due to construction defects. So if the concrete was not placed properly, it may exhibit spalling or exposed rebar. Using inferior building materials can cause significant problems. So uh, again, not following the approved concrete mix design, the soil does not achieve proper compaction, the contractor must continue to compact the soil until the criteria is met. Again, asphalt, asphalt mix should match the approved submittal and it should reach the minimum required density. 
restoration of sidewalks or ramps are not being ADA compliant. If the work is not properly captured as a construction zone, which would include having proper barriers, lighting and pedestrian access, and security guards were not properly coordinated to work airside. Next slide, please. Moving on to field conditions and scope changes. If there's any changes in the field, uh, the AEOR must notify the REO as soon as possible. The field inspector will notify the resident engineer who will determine the best path to capture the conditions, whether that's through an official scope change or an as-built. Typically for fire life safety or code related issues, the AEOR must submit an official scope change for PAQED design standards review. For minor field changes or conditions, the revisions can be captured on the as-built drawings with the resident engineer's concurrence. Next slide, please. Moving on to the certification requests for inspections. PA inspections are scheduled through receipt of the AEUR signed and sealed certification requests. No inspections will be conducted on scopes of work with open design comments or installations deviating from the latest PA approved drawings. Uh, we require that an AUR or representative of the AUR who is knowledgeable of the scope of work must be present during the inspection along with the contractor and any subcontractors that are required to operate, test, or demonstrate any systems during an inspection and provide access uh, via equipment, tools, ladders to access the area of the inspection. Next slide, please. And if I could just emphasize the at each of the inspections, the ask is to have the AUR or a representative from the engineer records office that is knowledgeable. Um, as it is a request, this is, the inspection is actually the request from the engineer of record saying the area of work is ready for the port authority to audit so we can continue the progress to close out. Um, if any uh, attendees, whether it be QAD fire protection unit, REO, or a facility um, uh, electric uh, representative is on site asking questions. We want to make sure that the engineer of record or their designee has the appropriate responses and is able to uh, provide the necessary information to in response to the question that will help mitigate and lessen the amount of comments that are being generated if those if the information provided is found acceptable. So by having that knowledgeable person on site is definitely um, a very proactive way in progressing with the work and achieving no comment at each of the inspections. So it's a requirement. We will not honor an inspection if a representative is not at the, not in attendance at the inspection. Thank you. Next slide. It's going to go over what's required to submit an AUR certification request. At a minimum, it's an AUR cover letter to request an inspection, a PH212 for a partial, or a PH314 for a final. A sketch showing the area being certified, if it's applicable, special inspections checklist, special inspection and test reports, and record drawings if for a final. Uh, for a sketch, if it's for a partial and it's applicable, a sketch can be used to outline the scope of the inspection, and it should include at a minimum a unique sketch number. It should include the TA number and title it should be dated with a legend identifying the area being certified and include an AEOR professional seal and signature. And it's important to note that the sketch is not taking a drawing sheet from the approved drawing and leaving it in the current state of approval and just adding a sketch number and a TA number, that's not how it works. Um, the title block must be removed all the applicable notes because they could relate to um, an inspection requirement that may not be there and it's being certified. So it must be removed, showing each of these items that we're requesting. And we're not looking for seven pages of sketches it's really a consolidation of one or two that highlights and outlines the area being certified. You can put notes there stating that we're looking for MEP. Or we could be looking for all above ceiling. Um, you can add those specific requirements on the sketch. 
You will be also annotating that on your PH212 uh, under the description area of work. You can say all work as per sketch, uh, you know, sketch number and TA number, uh, date with the date, with the approved date. Um, so it's, it's quite simple. If the drawings are clearly uh, defined so that you do not need to have a sketch, for example, you could be looking for an above ceiling in a room, a, a generator, an electrical closet. You could just spell that out and you don't need a sketch. So it's a case by case basis, but I do want to be clear the sketch should be max two sheets with a sketch number such as PASK. 301 and the second sketch could be 302, but it shouldn't be the same number um, for each of the sketches. I just want to put emphasis there because that is a constant problem that I see, a reoccurring problem that I see. So I just want to highlight that. Thank you. We can go on to the next slide, please. We're just going to outline the difference between a partial versus a final inspection. To clarify, a final inspection is used when all work for the entire TAA is complete, whereas a partial inspection is used when all work within a specific area or scope of work is complete. Sketches may be used to outline the scope of work being certified, and a partial inspection can either be for occupancy or not for occupancy, depending on whether or not um, the tenant is requesting beneficial use of the area or asset. Partial inspections not for occupancy are used prior to closing access to an area that must be inspected. But again, we're not looking for beneficial use or occupancy. So this could include, in the context of civil or aviation fueling, it could be a pipe that has to be inspected prior to backfilling an area. We would request a partial inspection for that specific area that's going to be uh, backfilled. A partial inspection for occupancy is used when beneficial use is requested, again, as per the approved design phasing plans. And required documents at the PA inspection, the AUR is to lead the inspection with the Port Authority and should ensure that the latest PA approved documents are available. And this could include the latest RFI, submittal, shop drawings, and special inspection and test reports that should be available in case any questions arise that we can pull up the documents and refer to during the inspection. And this will all help to reduce any inspection comments. Next slide, please. Just going to highlight the key takeaways and the tips for success during the construction phase. We want to strive for full design approval prior to the pre-construction meeting. This helps to avoid field issues or any delays in scheduling inspections. We recommend that the EOR performs an on-site walkthrough as the design is under review. Communicating is the key to success, making sure that the tenant team is keeping the REO informed of any field changes or issues that arise. The EOR and the general contractor is to coordinate with the REO in advance for any pre-inspections or pre-testings so that the REO can attend if necessary. Planning ahead, GC to provide a two-week look ahead and advance notice for any upcoming milestones, which could include pre-testing, active testing, port authority inspection requests. We recommend that the AEOR submit a draft certification request package for REO review prior to submitting the sign and seal version to reduce the number of iterations or revisions required. And the PA punch list or inspection comments should be addressed in a timely manner. ARIO recommends maximum two week to debate all of the items. Uh, we're gonna pass it back to Ryan to continue the presentation. Thank you very much. And with this, we have come to the last part of this webinar, which is the inspection process. And this is with Jamal Alpagalis. Jamal, can you hear us? He may be having some issues with his uh, computer, his connectivity. Okay. That seems to be a problem. I have no issue helping. Okay. You can, you can take it over, Carmela. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. So for um, 
the inspections process. Carmela, thank you for taking over. I think you'll you'll do a better job than Great. me. No, no, you go go for it. I will oh. interject when I need. Oh goodness gracious, Jamal! Oh now now I feel the pressure. Um, no, no, so no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, you. thank you, thank you. So the the quality assurance division uh, for inspections is um, an offset of the certification that we get from the engineer of record. Once the REO receives it, it's the documents are in conformance. The REO confirms that the area is ready for a PA audit. We go ahead and schedule that on the calendar. Someone from Jamal's group or fire protection group or our elevator escalator group will be in attendance. And um, again, this is an outline from that perspective. So they attend these inspections to ensure compliance with all the TAA documents, including the drawings and specifications and applicable codes. This is something that, you know, REO at the forefront is also making sure before we get to this point, um, as we've mentioned before, the ultimate goal is the issuance of a permit to occupy. Uh, that's the final permit. However, there will be milestone uh, or phased occupancies that you'll be um, requesting at some point throughout the construction. Um, that will just go through the same process. As for air side, um, the inspections will include aprons, taxiways, drainage, and other facilities, fencing and striping. These are all important elements uh, for these uh, for this element of work. For land side, we'll look at the streets, the signage, again, ADA uh, sidewalks, uh, pitch ramping, um, tactical uh, uh, curbs. Uh, utilities, the parking lots, um, again, fencing and striping. When it comes for the aviation fueling, they will be focusing on the piping installation, the type of piping, um, was there welding, is there special inspection reports to, to uh, that we're hoping that the engineer record would have handy at the time of the inspection to provide a submittal to show the installation and, and if there's welding requirements, the approvals that you know, they have on hand just to mitigate any any questions that may arise from that inspection. They'll be looking for the storage tanks, the pumps, and again, coating and cathodic protection, leak detection systems. Uh, again, all special inspections and the special inspections checklist that is shared with the resident engineer's office to make sure that all the special inspections that are required based on the um, approved drawing sheets uh, we'll make sure that that checklist, uh, re the resident engineer's office shares that with the quality assurance uh, inspectors to ensure that we're all on the same page and all the inspections that are required have been held and they're signed off successfully by the engineer record. Next slide, please. Airside. So for aprons, they're looking for a level surface, the thickness, and the expansion and control joints, uh, dowels, uh, the placement of the dowels, um, drainage, and any special testing that's required. Uh, the same goes for the taxiways. We're looking for the surface, the thickness of the surface, um, the lighting, making sure that um, the proper uh, 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 lighting gives the right uh, uh, foot candles. Um, so we'll be looking for that test and participating in that test as well. Um, drainage, um, any other special testing that's requirement. Uh, and that's including the density of the asphalt, like we mentioned during the resident engineer's office slide presentation. Um, piping and manholes, invert elevations, compaction, manhole cover ratings, making sure they're rated for aeronautical use. Um, there's a special coverage, making sure that the covers are installed as required by design. They shouldn't just be shimmed and left alone. Um, as we know, uh, heavy equipment is traversing that, uh, that, that area. So we have to make sure the installation is, is compliant. The engineer record uh, being out there as often as possible prior to the inspection to make sure that um, this, this installation is compliant, making sure that the bolting is complete. If there's structural bolts, uh, we should see that special inspection report and having the engineer record having that handy. If there's uh, security um, protocols, whether it's fencing or razor ribbons, making sure that uh, those areas are also complete and installed properly. 
um, grounding. That's another um, critical element of work. We would want to see the licensed um, electrician uh, provide us that uh, grounding report to make sure that everything is uh, is compliant. Uh, tension wires and rods and any obstruction lighting, all this is in place. So when we bring QAD out for that audit, all this work should be ready inspected by the engineer record, by the resident engineer's office, by all special inspection agencies. So it should be a very clear and easy process. We're also looking at striping, the color, the type, the thickness, making sure that the striping that they installed was um, applicable for the installation that, uh, whether it's air side or street side. Next slide, please. Land side, street. Work. We're looking for, again, compaction of soil, uh, proper drainage, again, the, the proper lighting lumens uh, for each light pole that may be installed, the signage, does it make sense? Is the signage secured? Um, striping again. Sidewalks again, compaction, the levelness, the A ADA, making sure there's no trip hazards. Uh, the same for parking lots, uh, drainage, again, manholes, invert elevations, compactions, manhole covers and so on. This is just the same of what we look for. So it's it's a good cheat sheet for the engineer record to make sure they have a checklist before, um, you know, coming out to the inspection to make sure that all these items have been reviewed and they're in conformance. Next slide, please. Fueling, the type of piping, the installation, is it properly supported? The welding that's required on the piping, is it as per the approved submittal? Is it complete? Uh, is it in conformance? So we'd be looking again for that special inspection report stating such, making sure the engineer record is reviewed them to make sure that uh, the work is in conformance. Type of storage tanks, where they're located, how they're tied in, are they properly um, placed if, uh, you know, based on the drawings? The hydrant fueling. Um, emergency shutoff uh, systems, emergency fuel shutoff systems, is that in place? Leak detection, making sure the test reports are all submitted and having them on hand at the time of the inspection. Uh, any flushing that's required for the overall system. Uh, all these reports should be on hand, ready to share, should a question arise. Next question, uh, next slide, please. So Jamal, do you wanna take this one on? Or would you like me to continue? I'll, ta I'll take over this. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, this is the water supply piping. It really has to do with the, uh, the, the only thing that I want to highlight here, since we don't have fire protection, is the is the flushing of the of the piping per per the applicable code and FPA and. Uh, You'll see in the in the next few picture why. Uh, go to the next slide, please. This is a, this is a few pipes that this is a few rocks that came out of pipes, and uh, and uh, this so is this why is the, we flush. Yeah, this is the this important. This is why we flush. Yes, this is, and we've yeah. seen this here. And not to interject, Jamal, but. You know, at the at, at LaGuardia, when we when we didn't flush, or the contractor uh, was preparing to flush, and we saw you know these di diameter rocks so coming I'll, out I'll of the pipe, it. it was, yeah, it was just that important uh, reason why we do this. So Jamal, thank you for you know showing this. Please continue. Yeah, yeah. Go to the next slide. I I mean, the special inspections, I won't go through much of that. It's, it's really the compaction and welding and, and things of that nature that we look for. And uh, <clears throat> key, key to the access, I, I don't want to repeat the same things that, that Danny and Carmela says, but there's one thing I really want to emphasize here. Follow the drawing. Uh, whatever, whatever you design and went through, design standard and it's got approved. If you follow it, you'll have no problems passing the inspection. You'll have no problem getting the permit for, for any TAA. 
Uh, another thing I want to emphasize, which I think Danny talked about, is design standard. The earlier you can you can solve on the better. Going through an inspection with open de design standard comment, open review comments, it, it's really add a layer of complications that uh, that, that uh, we, we don't need. And if you deviated from the drawings, it's you know submit uh, the change of scope early. I don't want to discover that at the final inspection. It just adds, it will definitely delay the process and cost you time and money. Uh, I think the rest of it was covered by Danny about the engineer record showing up as often as he can. And, uh, and, and that's really, that's it. Any, anything, anybody have any question? I, I'll be more happy to answer. So thank you for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamal. Thanks. Carmela. Thanks for, thanks for Carmela. Thanks for Carmela.